Today I'm going to be reviewing the Vizio P-Series Quantum X model number, aka their flagship TV for 2020-2021. It comes with an attractive price tag with all the bells and whistles you would want in a 4K QLED TV and may be the perfect pairing for this new generation of consoles. At launch it had quite a bit of issues with the firmware that held a lot of users from picking it up. In this video we will be going over if those issues have been fixed, how well the tech that is inside the sky is implemented, the overall build quality, its smart features, performance, and current issues. If you are unfamiliar with modern day 4K television tech, I made a video to bring you up to speed that is linked in the description below that I highly recommend watching before proceeding in this video to get the full benefit of this review. Quick disclaimer, I did receive this product for free through Best Buy's Tech Insider program in exchange for a written unbiased review on bestbuy.com, but out of my own volition also chose to do a video review. This will not bias my opinion in any way, shape, or form, and my thoughts and opinions are my own as they provided me with no information at all about this TV. They just sent it to me. Moving on to the build quality slash aesthetics. This TV comes with a standard plastic back that is textured with a large glossy Vizio logo slapped on. The front sports a sleek bezel free design and an aluminum base with a charcoal finish. This base is solid with minimal wobble. The overall TV is rather bulky for a modern day television coming in at about two inches and heavy at 80 pounds due to the full array local dimming. Between the 75 inches and the 80 pounds, it takes some work to get up on that wall. While getting my mountain, I noticed a minor amount of creaking and flex on the very bottom of the device, but otherwise it was solid. Nothing broke in, caved in, or became damaged, so I have no worries on the overall build quality. Personally, I don't mind the look, but it won't be winning any beauty contests. The inputs are located on the left side of the TV, going from top to bottom. They include a USB 2.0, composite inputs times one, four 2.1 HDMI ports, an optical port, RCA audio out, antenna, and an ethernet port. Two of the 2.1 HDMI ports support 120 hertz, while another supports eARC, with the last being the one who got hit with the ugly stick and is just basic. Poor guy. They feel good, look good, and are solid. You have nowhere to hide the cables. The buttons that control the TV are on the back right or left, depending on your orientation, and include turning on slash off the TV, increasing or lowering the volume, and changing sources. The buttons feel a bit mushy, wobble a bit, and have a mild amount of overall travel and require a light amount of pressure to actuate. Overall, this is the cheapest feeling part. The screen itself is made from a semi-gloss texture, ensuring that you get a sharp picture with a mild reduction in glare, which I appreciate as I prefer glossy screens over matte screens, as matte screens may do a better job at cutting down glare, but also soften the overall picture. Whereas glossy screens have a bit more glare, but remain sharp. With how bright this guy gets, you should not have to worry about reflections, no matter how bright the room is. Last up is the remote, which is basic and disappointing, which is what women have told me my entire life. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the same exact remote came with the free TV that my parents got with their couch that retailed for $200 five years ago. The entire remote is plastic, is rather large, and has no sleekness whatsoever. It uses IR instead of Bluetooth. The buttons are membrane switches and feel exactly like any other remote you have ever used in your life, including those from the 90s, if you were even alive back then. The only redeeming quality is that it has pre-made shortcut keys. These keys include access to the SmartCast system, Watch Free TV, Vudu, Netflix, Prime Video, Zumo, Hulu, and Redbox. Earlier, I said I don't care if my TV looks basic as long as it performs well. Unfortunately for this guy, performance is hit or miss. Sometimes it's super snappy and responsive, other times super slow like my sense of humor. Occasionally it's like my grandpa and doesn't do anything at all because he's dead. I have found that pointing my remote at my ceiling instead of directly at the TV makes it work more reliably and a lot faster, so I guess those trick shots that I've been watching from Dude Perfect really do help. I was really hoping to get something premium to hold to operate my TV, but that isn't going to happen. As harming a remote doesn't work well on this TV, I tried to set it up and it would not work reliably even after going through the teaching process, so you might as well just throw that one right out the window. Thankfully, the CEC function works well with this TV, so for the best operation, you want to turn on the device you want to watch first, which will then turn on the TV, at which point you can use that device's remote or Harmony remote to control that system and do whatever you want. But you'll still need the TV remote to change picture settings and inputs manually, so don't lose it. 
Moving on to the smart features, it comes with Vizio's SmartCast system, which comes pre-installed with 200 plus apps that has no marketplace where you can search slash download new ones from. It includes most of what you would want. Follow the link in the description below for a full list of them. Personally, I found it to be very snappy. It was quick in loading apps and streams even when I was switching things quickly. Overall presentation mimics the Fire TV stick layout wise. Picture quality was not as good as a dedicated streaming box, likely due to the 802.11 AC dual band Wi-Fi not working correctly. My download speeds vary between one to five megabytes per second, which is simply not enough as Netflix requires 25 megabits per second to stream 4k content this left me with lower resolutions which explains why it did not look as good as my dedicated box hopefully this will be fixed with a firmware update no this is not an issue with my internet as that goes up to 300 megabits down per second on everything else in my house it supports apple airplay 2 and chromecast which allow you to control your tv through your voice with siri google assistant and or alexa i tried all three of those voice assistants and my results varied greatly setup was rather simple you go to the extras tab after bringing up the smartcast menu and then select which device you want to pair follow the steps on the screen and you are good to go i was hoping the operation would be just as simple as the setup but it wasn't you need to use specific wording to get things to work and despite saying them correctly they often came back with errors part of this could be user error but i do a lot of things through voice and usually don't have any issues as i'm very used to saying specific things to get specific things to happen. I found that Alexa worked the best and you could use the most amount of variability with commands and have them still work. Next best was Google with Siri being in dead last. What a surprise there. If you are serious about controlling your TV with your voice, I recommend going with an Amazon device paired with Fire TV as they work wonderfully together. You can also cast things to your TV. I found this worked well, but only in 1080p as 4K wasn't available to me no matter what device I tried from, which included my iPhone 12 Pro, iPad Pro and gaming PC. This once again could be due to that wireless. I'm not sure. At one point I had an issue where it was loading into apps and I could connect my device, but not get any media to actually play. This was fixed with the tried and trusted reboot of the TV by unplugging it and plugging it back in as there's nowhere to blow on it and kicking its screen sounded like a bad idea. Moving on to performance, the settings that I used was calibrated dark on mostly stock settings. Occasionally I would tinker with the local contrast setting and change it to low or medium, along with adjusting the active full array between low, medium, or high, depending on the quality of content I was watching. Most of the time I kept local contrast on low and active full array on high with motion control jutter reduction and motion blur reduction on three with clear action turned off or else I noticed some uh, jitters and jumping and issues with overall motion clarity while watching content but not with gaming which I'll get to in a bit. What's great about this TV is that it supports all the HDR formats, including Adobe Vision, HDR10, HDR10+, and HLG, which few TVs do. The next part is going to come at no surprise, but things look the best on physical media through a Adobe Vision capable 4K Blu-ray player with 4K discs. Second place went to gaming either on PC or console. Third went to 4K HDR streamed media. Fourth, 4K non-HDR media. 5th, 1080p SDR media, 6th, 720p and lower media, which is consistent with A, the technology as bitrate will constantly go down with all that, which means that you have less data to work with and increased compression. B, once you switch off HDR media, you go from 1.07 billion colors and up to 4,000 nits of brightness to 16.7 million colors up to 100 to 300 nits of brightness with older content having worse mastering due to the limited tech available back then. Dolby Vision, also looked better than HDR10 slash HDR10 plus, which looked better than standard def. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because this guy is a freaking monster and looks spectacular and will blow your socks off. Seriously, I walk around sockless now because my TV blew them all away. The picture... <laughs> The picture gets incredibly bright with near OLED level black, supporting an insane contrast ratio with minimal blooming. Pictures are sharp with vibrant, accurate colors. I did not notice any crushed blacks, washed out whites, blanding, haloing, etc. unless it was a defect in the recording slash mastering, as you can immediately 
and I mean immediately notice any scenes that use lower quality cameras, do not have as good of mastering, have low bitrate, or have a defect in it. With this TV being so large, everything is massive, which means that fuzzy spot in the very bottom, bottom left of the corner of the screen, yeah, you can see it and it's distracting, which I notice more and more the lower quality the content got, which can make this TV look horrible when paired with horrible source material as it makes it stick out like a sore thumb. At first I thought this was because maybe this TV wasn't so great, but upon looking closer at the aberrant behavior, I found that it wasn't due to the TV, but a defect or poorly mastered source material as I could reproduce the same things on other screens. I just noticed them easier on this guy because it's 75 inches with top of the line tech. There were a few times that I noticed the full array lighting being a bit too aggressive, which created a mild amount of blooming. Overall, I rarely found Vizio's algorithm to be overly aggressive, but it did happen here and there. I do think most of the issues that people were having early on are now either fixed due to firmware updates or because they thought the screen looked terrible when it was actually the opposite and was the original source material looking bad or just in the normal side effects of QLED technology and full array backlights and so on and so forth, which I go over just a little bit in that first video that I mentioned at the very beginning of the video. If you don't understand that tech, then you don't. Un Anyways, as for the upscaling, I can't say as I didn't really notice it. I want to spend a bit of time talking about gaming on this guy. I tried it both on my gaming PC and my PlayStation 4 as I haven't been able to snag an RTX 3080 or PlayStation 5 yet to try out the 2.1 HDMI spec of 4K at 120Hz with 4.4.4 sub sampling. Woo! That's a lot of tech right there. Which left me at either 4K HDR at 60Hz or 1080p HDR at 120Hz, which is what I went with. As 1440 p is currently not officially supported on this guy hopefully that will be fixed after a firmware update i found overall latency to be great with only a mild difference between it and my asus pg 279q on human benchmark i was getting around 200 milliseconds on the tv and about 170 to 180 milliseconds on my pg 279q on average i get that this isn't the best metric of measuring but it's the only one i've got i think the difference for most users will be negligible as i was still able to play through call of duty black ops Cold War on Veteran as well as play through Spider-Man and the Taskmaster challenges while getting ultimate scores without any issues, both of which require fast reaction times and high amounts of precision and the TV didn't hold me back at all. Just my complete and utter lack of skill. Overall picture was phenomenal and often let me sitting there in awe as colors were accurate and dynamic. Contrast, whether it be a very dark scene, a very bright scene, or both had a bunch of detail and texture and getting massive amounts of brightness was awesome. I didn't notice any issues at all with motion and kept all motion settings off except for game mode. I think this is per a perfect match for the PS5 and Xbox Series X. If you are a hardcore competitive gamer, you'll have to decide if it, having increased colors, 1.07 billion versus 16.7 million, exceedingly better contrast ratio of 15,000 versus at, at the most 1,000 and 800 to 2,800 nits versus 3 to 500 nits will be worth that 30 milliseconds of input latency you are giving up. Other users have complained of issues with VRR. I didn't experience any issues with it on the PC or PS4 and had that setting on when it should have been off since I use a NVIDIA GPU as NVIDIA GPUs don't support FreeSync and the PS4 doesn't support VRR. The PS5 does support HDMI VRR, but not FreeSync, and currently it does not support the HDMI VRR, but that's supposed to be coming in a future update. The Xbox One supports VRR and FreeSync, with the Xbox Series X supporting FreeSync ranges between 30 and 120 hertz. The FreeSync range on this TV is 48 hertz to 120 hertz. Hertz. Holy crap, that was a lot of information. Moving on to viewing angles, it's a VA panel, so you've got the typical defects of that type of panel, not having as good of viewing angles when going off axis. A lot of other written reviews mention blooming. The fine print states that the full array local dimming is only active during video, which is why menus look so awful. Menus are also usually done with low quality images, which only exacerbates the whole thing, as you can see horrible banding. I did find this to be the case on my set, but once I went into to any type of video that was immediately resolved. There were occasions where the full array backlight was a bit too aggressive, which is when I would turn it down to medium or low and it would do just fine. For some bad standard def material, I had to go to low on full array backlight for it to look good, but that was few and far between. I'd experience issues on a sliding scale with the higher quality content, almost never having anything wrong with it. And if it did have something wrong with it, it was just for a scene or two. And it happened relatively often with poor 
SDR content, especially poor SDR content that was super old, which is me saying that if you're watching a lot of old SDR content or a lot of standard def content, this TV might not be the best choice just because you might really notice that it doesn't look super great. Blacks look tremendous on this TV no matter what type of content you are watching. They aren't OLED level blacks, but they are getting closer. The brightness of this TV is fantastic. There were a lot of times I would get blinded by it changing from a very dark scene to a very bright scene as blacks are black and whites are white and can get freaking bright. The onboard speakers are average across the board, which I'm okay with as I don't want to pay a premium for great speakers that no matter what you do will sound terrible. This TV is best paired with a quality sound system as it supports Adobe Atmos pass-through via the eARC enhanced audio return channel on HDMI 1. Moving on to the issue, some issues that I read in other reviews were that the auto didn't follow through to another input. I didn't find that to be the case, but was also using the optical port for everything, which could be why I didn't notice it. Users reported that VRR wasn't working. However, this has since been fixed with the most recent firmware update. I haven't noticed any software bugs with CEC. The bugs I did see were for my own user error. I did not notice any issues with the local dimming, so that also appears to have been fixed through firmware. I did notice that early on, sometimes it wouldn't pick up that I had a source plugged in and turned on, which made me have to switch to another source and then back to get it to work correctly, but that has since resolved. At one point, SmartCast and AirPlay weren't working correctly either, where it would load everything, just not play any videos. I'm plugging in, plugging in the TV back in, fix this. In that same vein, this TV takes a long time to turn on, and I really do mean that. It's probably five to five seconds ish to turn on. It also has extremely dark blacks when it first turns on before it registers a source, which makes it appear off. So, I would think oftentimes that I was powering it on and due to the screen still looking off, I would then power it off and think that it just wasn't working correctly. So a quick fix for that is to be patient and look at the LED indicator on the far left side or right side, depending on how you're looking at the TV to see if it's on or off. The infrared for this guy is also a bit hit and miss, which can be frustrating, but also appears to be getting better the longer I own the TV for. Moving on to the conclusion, so this was a super long review that was hopefully beneficial. Write your favorite superhero in the comment section below if you made it this far. I'm going to keep this short. The picture quality on this TV is phenomenal, and most of the issues that plagued it on launch are now resolved. It still has some issues that need to be ironed out, but in general, it does a brilliant job at gaming and media watching, making it an all-around hit. The remote kind of sucks, as do the speakers, but for that extremely competitive price tag, I can't complain much. If you enjoyed this review, leave a like. If you didn't like this review, leave a dislike. And of course, hit that subscribe button if you want to see more like this. I will post a link directly to this TV that takes you to Best Buy's website. That is not an affiliate link. I will see you and your beautiful face on the next one. Peace out and God bless.